Let's pray. Gracious Lord, all around us in the world today, we seem to live with antagonism. There's anger, there's bitterness. Nothing seems to be in harmony. And yet, Lord, you call us to be reconciled, to be reconcilers. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us to understand what this means, how we have even been reconciled to you. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, most of the time when I think of the term reconcile, I uh, envision um, Carol sitting there with our bank book and trying to figure out how what we have in our checkbook doesn't quite match what uh, the bank statement has said. And every once in a while, there'll be, I can hear this throughout the whole house, yay! <laughs> it reconciled. <laughs> what we had in the book is what they gave us on the sheet. Today in our look at the impact of forgiveness, we're looking at this idea of reconciliation. What does it mean to be reconciled? And so I thought, you know, maybe I better look this up in the dictionary. Uh, just, and it says to reconcile, to establish a close relationship, to settle or to resolve, and to make compatible or consistent. One of the best examples of reconciliation is that story of Joseph and his brothers that uh, Polly had for the children's lesson and also that Sarah read in our Old Testament reading. But you know, when you look at the story of Joseph, there's really two sections to this story of Joseph. There's on the one side, I'm going to say that's the love side. And on this side is the hate side. If you look at the whole story of Joseph, and it starts around chapter 37 or so in Genesis, you have the fact that Joseph's dad, Jacob, Israel, loved Joseph. Loved him so much, gave him all sorts of special favors, even that brightly colored coat, the coat of many colors. They, he loved them. But the brothers over here hated him. They hated him because of that coat. They hated him because he got special treatment. And they really hated him when Joseph came and said, hey, I had a dream last night, and guess what? All of you are going to fall down and worship me. That didn't win any points with his brothers. And then on the love side, we have the fact that, well, I, I should go back to the brothers, because they hated him so much, they sold him into captivity. But really... They sold him as a, a second choice because initially they threw him into the pit and all of a sudden the text tells us, but there wasn't any water in it. They wanted to kill him. And when that didn't work, they said, okay, well, we'll sell him into captivity. So when they sell him into captivity, he's bought by Potiphar. And Potiphar said, well, yeah, he's a good worker and everything else. I wouldn't necessarily say Potiphar loved him. In fact, when we get to that whole story, it's actually the other way. But Potiphar's wife, I don't say that he loved Joseph, but she certainly lusted after him. 
And over here, then Potiphar, when he finds this out, he sends Joseph off to prison. And while he's in prison, Joseph meets two servants of Pharaoh that were there, not exactly sure why, but they're there in prison. And one is the cupbearer. And the cupbearer has this dream, and he tells Joseph, and Joseph says, hey, good news. Three days, you're going to be reinstated as the cupbearer to Pharaoh. Well, the baker was also in prison, and he also had a dream. He's over here on the hate side because when he told his dream to Pharaoh, or to Joseph, Joseph said, three days and you're going to be dead. So all of Joseph's life is kind of this between hate and between love and between hate. And yet he becomes one of the, the best examples of reconciliation. Because what were Joseph's choices when the brothers appear? When the famine hits and Jacob says, go down to Egypt, they've got grain. What are his choices? Because they didn't recognize him. He could look at his brothers and he could say, ah, now it's my turn. You don't know who I am. I'm second in command in all of Egypt. I can get back at you right now. Or he could show mercy. He could be reconciled with his brothers. In verse 20 that Sarah read, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. Joseph really had a choice to either forgive his brothers, to be reconciled to them, or to just lower the hammer on them and throw them all in prison and just let them rot there. But the story of Joseph shows us all about how reconciliation is so vital and so important to not only our relationship with one another, but our relationship with God. What do we have or what do we get without forgiveness and reconciliation? Well, we can kind of look around in the world right now. There's anger, there's bitterness, there's anxiety, there's hurtfulness, there's mistrust, there's fighting, there's war, and you can add your own list. Even when the brothers come and after Jacob dies, the brothers have another scheme to make sure that Joseph will be nice to them. In verse 15, he says, but now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong we did to him, they said. Without reconciliation and without forgiveness, it's just a never-ending cycle of anger and bitterness and war and mistrust. And that's why Jesus' expectation for the church was entirely different. In Matthew 18, that section that Sarah read, all too often that section is read to kind of justify something that within the church, the phrase is excommunication. 
And literally what that means is you kind of toss someone out of the church and you say, we are not in communion again anymore. So you're outside. And that passage, unfortunately, has been used to kind of justify that. But if we look at what Jesus said, what is he talking about? It's not how do we get rid of people we disagree with, but how do we bring us closer together in compatibility? How do we strengthen our relationship? As Polly said, she got a crack on her thumb. We're all going to have cracks. I hate to tell you that. We all have cracks, okay? And we all need to be healed. And when something occurs between, if you read that Matthew 18 passage, it says, if a believer has sinned against you, if there's some hassle, some turmoil within the church between two people, what do you do? You go and you talk to that person. You don't talk to this person over here. You talk to the person that you have the trouble with, that, or that, where that relationship has been strained. And you mend that through forgiveness, through repentance and forgiveness. And if that one-on-one -on -one doesn't work, you bring two or three others. Not that you're going to continue to beat down on the other person, but together, let's get the, let's understand where the, the problem is with the purpose to bring unity back to the congregation. And then if that doesn't work, the last part says, okay, then treat that individual as if he was a pagan or a tax collector. I want to ask you, how did Jesus view the pagans and the tax collectors? He wanted to bring them in. It's not that you're getting rid of somebody. You're saying, now I need to even work harder to bring this person back into that unity and that communion. That's Jesus' expectation for the church. And Peter, or Paul picked that up later on in his letters. In Romans chapter 5, verses 8 to 11, he said, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. In our relationship with Christ, we have that reconciliation with God, which then we use in our relationship with each other. That's what Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians 5, when he said this, And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak 
for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be an offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That's Jesus' expectation for the church. That's his expectation for all of us in our relationship with him that we have that same attitude in our connection with others. And so we have to ask ourselves, is there a Joseph in our life? Or have you been Joseph? Is there a Joseph in your life that you have hurt, that you have harmed, that you have tried to throw in the well, or some people will say throw under the bus? Is there a Joseph in our life that we need to reconcile with? Or have you been Joseph where others have thrown you under the bus? The message of reconciliation or the impact of forgiveness and reconciliation is that now the Lord works through us, gives us that strength and a power and ability. I love Joseph's line, you meant it for harm, but God meant it for good, that he would be there to take care of his family and to take care of Egypt and to take care of the whole world at that point. Reconciliation, the impact of reconciliation involves confession. It involves repentance. It involves forgiveness. It involves mercy. And it brings about restoration. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you have reconciled us to you and through your son reconciled us to one another. Lord, help us to remember that you are there and that you have given us and entrusted us with this wonderful message of reconciliation. In your name we pray, amen.